Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guest is Peter Andrew Sacco. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brews. <laughs> like this thing? Welcome to Books and Brews, episode number 58. So, Laura, what have you been doing this month? Well, we escaped Duluth, Minnesota, northern Minnesota, that has temperatures of 25 to 35 below zero for the lovely paradise of Tennessee. That's moderate and beautiful. And this week, we were warned that it would get to five below zero. So I have spent the week packing blankets, packing blankets, and uh, bubble wrap, and old cardboard, and ripping up boxes from our move, and insulating those poor rabbits as well as I can. And chickens. um, And chickens. Yeah, I was a little less worried about the chickens because they don't lay eggs anyway. (laughs) So (laughs) they're... You're living on borrowed time. <laughs> Heading to freezer camp, as our friends here say, because they're not giving us eggs. So not that I'd want them to be cold or uncomfortable. Oh, I learned to knit. My friend D came, and so I knit for the first time in my life an actual thing. So actually, this is the second time in my life I made a scarf and a half for my granddaughter, too. How about you? Um, well, chasing after you, chasing after the bunnies, and um, <laughs> making singing. me hot <clears throat> Irish coffees after I come. Very in. definitely, yes, I'm, I'm very good at that. Uh, chopping a lot of firewood, and uh, you know, also uh, shoveling this wonderful white stuff that we thought we left behind. Right. So, and um, part of that included getting our new truck stuck in the driveway, but we yeah. don't have to really chat about that. Yeah, it was ironic. We, um, I think, what does Tennessee get? A couple inches a year, if that. And we got eight inches, so we literally got about. Four years worth of snow in one day. <laughs> now, to us being from Duluth, eight inches is like the morning snow. Um, so, what yeah. have you been reading, Laura? You know, I'm I'm kind of cheating here because I forgot to mention this book a couple months ago. But I think this is actually right up our guest's alley. It is called Smoky Mountains Mysteries, Stories About Magnificent Mountains and Unique People. And it is a lot of kind of stories of haunted houses and mysterious events and the legends of creatures that supposedly live in the Appalachians. And then I can't quite say I read it, but I aspired to read it. And as busy as we've been, that's actually a pretty good start. So this is Ill-Gotten Gains. And this is our guest from maybe about three months ago, Ralph Gerald's. And it's the story of what happened to the 30 pieces of silver. So I'm interested to read that. They turn up in the modern day. And of course, you don't necessarily want to be associated, I think, with the 30 people of silver that Judas was given for betraying Christ. So how about you? Did you get any reading done? Uh, yeah, about half of a novel from uh, Mark Evans um, called The Protocols, which features all kinds of nefarious actors from across the globe, as well as people that are very interested in the the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, as well as nuclear uh, suitcase bombs and all sorts of interesting things. So uh, that's been a kind of a fun thing to read. And then other than that, I've been reading about quantum chemistry and quantum computing because I'm getting into that uh, at work and also some quantum financial modeling. So uh, that's a little less exciting. I won't dwell on that for fear of putting our audience to sleep. So Laura, who's our guest this month? So I say it every month. Every month, it's true. I'm very excited for who we have today. We have Peter Andrew Sacco. Say correct. Correct. Okay. Is that Italian? I'm half Italian and half French. So father Italian, mama French. So best of both worlds when it comes to good food and good wine. That's so funny. My kids are pretty much half German, half Irish, and that's meant to be the most stubborn combination there is. So I don't know. They have me for a mother, so... (laughs) I'm sure they're stubborn. Anyway, uh, welcome, Peter. Peter is the author of 30 books, fiction and nonfiction, and he is published on four continents. He is a resident expert and regular of top 50 USA radio and TV markets, including Fox, CBS, ABC, 
ESPN, Coast to Coast, iHeart, and over 100 major radio and TV networks. So you keep busy. Peter is a multi-award winning director, cinematographer, actor, and producer on seven continents. And believe me, I have questions about that. Uh, Peter has written more than 800 articles, self-help and fiction, appearing in major news media worldwide. He has been a university professor for 28 years, as well as being a psychologist specializing in criminal psychology, sports psychology, and addiction studies. And all of that and more, I believe, comes out in your books, which hopefully we will get to talking about. So with that being said, we can jump into cocktail number one. And I should mention this this cocktail kind of works both with the original reading and the reading Peter is actually doing. And <laughs> there is a reason for that. We'll talk about both books because they're both very interesting. But go ahead, uh, cocktail number one. Yes, this is basically a Bloody Mary or in this um, <clears throat> instance is called a Bloody Maru. And with all the blood, uh, dripping from the uh, readings as we had them first. Um, I just thought this was an excellent cocktail to start things off. So uh, in the shaker, we have some ice, we have some vodka and tomato juice with lemon juice, Worcestershire sauce, hot sauce, just a pinch, a little pinch of salt and pepper. And we're going to shake those with some ice. I kind of pre mix these things because I didn't want to waste time getting them all together. And so given all that stuff, we're going to shake it for maybe about 10 to 15 seconds you know, instead of just a few shape. And then, of course, for the uh, presentation, if you went to a fine restaurant, you might find that people might stick lobster tails in here, all those sorts of wonderful things. Um, but we're going to stick with a stick of celery and lemon for a garnish. And then we will strain this out of the uh, ice and everything else and see what we end up having. Some variants of this you'll see may have like tomato juice in them you know, or a lot of other artistic ingredients uh, in order to make an entire brunch, essentially, out of your morning breakfast beverage. But uh, here we have a Bloody Maru. So for the record, I hate Bloody Marys with passion. <laughs> um, we once got a Bloody Mary that had, like, everything you could imagine, including a lobster tail, just because, you know, you kind of couldn't not get something like that. So we ate all the food and left most of the Bloody Marys, so... <laughs> I'm not enthusiastic, <laughs> but here goes. You told me it wouldn't be quite as bad. Right there. You know, that's our measure of success. I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> do you like Bloody Marys <laughs> yourself? I can't say I'm a big fan of them. I live in wine country, so red wine. <laughs> Excellent choice. What kind of wine do you happen to have? Actually, uh, McGilligan's, which is Mc an uh, Australian wine. Go figure. I live in wine country here in Niagara on the Lake but I'm drinking Aussie wine because it is one of the best in the world. Do you live pretty close to Niagara Falls? Um, I, If I hopped in the car, I would be there. The actual falls itself, I could be there in five minutes. Oh, wow. Really Very nice. close. Well, we are ready for reading number one. The reading that I'm going to do is from a book that I wrote for fun. It's called Gummer, The World's Last Toothless Vampire, which was created for kids to read with parents, any, anywhere from older kids to tweens to look at issues with bullying, as I'm an um, anti-bullying advocate here in Canada, so I do a lot with bullying. So the reading involves Ted and his little new friend, James. Ted said nothing. He stared at the kid standing now before him, who didn't appear frightened in the least, that he just watched a vampire sucking blood, or traumatized that he had just been gang beaten. Can you make your eyes turn again? James asked sheepishly. Ted sighed, no. That was because of what you were holding the other night and threatening me with. Threatening you with? You tried to bite my neck. I mean, gum my neck. You acted like you were a vampire, dude. And man, you are a vampire. Ted sort of slouched back from James. You're right. Sorry about that, kid. After all, it was all new to me. And can you refrain from using the term gumming? It kind of hurts, if you know what I mean. Ted muttered, using the index and middle fingers on his right hand to mock fangs, and held them up to his mouth. Feeling both relaxed and momentarily amused on the moment, James chuckled. What is so funny? Ted asked. You, dude, you really are honest to Pete, a sucking vampire? You don't have any fangs or teeth for that gummer. 
James chuckled more. Like, what is up with that? Did you piss the tooth fairy off or something? Ted grimaced. What? James asked somewhat defensively. Apparently, there are such things as vampires, so I am guessing the tooth fairy and Santa Claus are real too. You don't know anything, kid, Ted snorted. Then tell me, Mr. Vampire, teach me about you and the legends that are real. Ted shook his head and folded his arms. The name is Ted. My name is Ted. Hell, Ted? James asked sarcastically. Apparently, you know I am a vampire. I have attacked you, and you just saw me feeding on your friend. Do I not frighten you? James shook his head. First of all, that was not my friend. None of them were. And as for scaring me, I ain't afraid of anything. I have been lonely and alone so long, I welcome the chance to meet anyone as weird or different like me. Very nice. Fantastic. Um, I always enjoy hearing these readings from the author. It's so different from hearing it in my head as I read it. So you have 30 books out, and I think a lot of those are nonfiction, self-help, psychology. What, what kinds of things do you write about typically? When it comes to self-help, a lot of it is psychologically related because I work with clients uh, predominantly because I'm back in the field as a psychologist. So yeah, I, I work in helping individuals with mental health issues or life coaching. So I do my whole therapy all online through a platform. So I believe I'm currently serving 41 countries. So I see folks from all over the world, which is kind of neat to be able to help individuals overcome their immediate mental health issues while achieving their short-term goals that will hopefully enable them to achieve their long-term goals and the best versions of themselves. So I would say a lot of it, Laura, is life coaching. Okay. Um, from that area. And then the fiction has always been a diversion since I was a psychology student and a screenwriter. Quite a change. Um, I'm just curious, if you're talking with people all over the world, do you speak multiple languages? <laughs> no, but sometimes I hear multiple voices in my head. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all speak English. <laughs> they all, yeah, they all speak English or uh, gibberish and then i realize that's me just mumbling to myself <laughs> no the whole platform is all english based i don't okay I, I haven't spoken french since i was last in france which was back in the 90s or italian was very loosey-goosey my nona raised me on it somewhat till i was five and that was the extent of it when did you branch out into children's books is that fairly recent um i would say i got into children's books around 2014 ish Okay. Because, because I do a lot of stuff with bullying, helping individuals, not only the victims of bullying, but the bully themselves. So the books themselves were perspective-taking books. If you go to actually on my website, there are free books you can download on bullying, including kids' books on okay. bullying for free. A bully can kind of put themselves in the victim's shoes, but mm -hmm. also the victim can kind of put themselves in the bully's shoes and see that the bully themselves are oftentimes a very insecure, very How frightened. How often does that help the victim? I mean, how many of them are willing to go, oh yeah, the poor guy? It's, it's interesting you bring that up, Laura, because I've sat on panels on radio shows where we have a concept, because I do a lot of work with spousal abuse as well too, and mm -hmm. I've done stuff with women's places for self-esteem and they've been victims of abuse mm -hmm. and the children. And so there's a concept that we use being a huge sports junkie that today's catchers are tomorrow's pitchers, meaning that if you take enough of the abuse over a period of time, you may become the abuser as a way of channeling it out or feeling the need to quasi defend yourself, but yet you're picking another target. And mm -hmm. so to go back to your question, I have found that there are a lot of victims of bullying that went the so online social media route and be, have become bullies. And that's really easy to do on social media because you never have to face anyone. <laughs> and I think a lot of people have spoken what a big problem that is with that anonymity. It is. And one of the the, the kickers was as a sitting on a panel with police officers going back once again, seven, eight years ago, um, there was a live call and show. I was only supposed to be on for 15 minutes. I wound up being two hours on there. So Fraser Crane, eat your heart out, buddy. Um, with that said, 
the call-in show, they had, they had a mother call in from British Columbia, western part of Canada, and her daughter had committed suicide because she had been swarmed at school by other girls, and then oh. it had spilled over to online social media. Mm -hmm. It was this online social media stuff that drove her over the edge, actually killed herself through that bullying, and that there really hit a nerve for me. Yeah, that's, that's hard. You had originally sent me another reading and I asked you to maybe adjust it only because I work with kids. And it's like, if I promote my program to parents, and they turn it on with their kids, you know, and it's a fascinating book. It wasn't that I didn't like it at all. I was just very wary of, of trying to stay very uh, PG at least. But it was a scene about the murder of a prostitute from a book called Jack or Jill. And that book has sort of a modern day Jack the Ripper. And the police officer in charge starts to think, what if this modern day Jack the Ripper is actually a woman? What piqued your interest in Jack the Ripper and, and this twist on the story? I used to be a criminal psychologist, so I used to help police at the highest levels, the federal level, and even, well, Canadian and American do profiling. So that's what I did. I had the great fortunes when I was doing my PhD and then my postdoc and studying with some of the best retired FBI profilers that I had taken courses with. And having taught criminal psych since, uh, gosh, 1999, I used to give students case studies to do, or they would also have to do oral presentations and discuss a killer or a crime that was never solved. Mm -hmm. Jack was always like, everybody liked Jack. There was always Jack, John, uh, John Benet Ramsey, Zodiac. And these Jack the Ripper ones were really cool. So a long while ago, I had written a novella on Jack as being Jill because okay. it could have been easy for Jack to have been a female, mm -hmm. you can call her Jill the Ripper, Jacqueline the Ripper, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And the premise of my story was always that it could have been a spurn lover that her husband had been sleeping with prostitutes back in uh, Whitechapel district of London, you know, in the 18, late 1800s, the, you know, prostitutes were a dime a dozen, they were everywhere. And the theory that I had postulated in a fictional uh, story that I wrote was that her husband or her lover was out and let's let's be honest, STDs were running rampant back then. That's, they're not a new thing today. And she had gotten infected by her husband's carousing around her boy or lover's boyfriend. And the boyfriend had infected her with an STD, which then rendered her barren. She did not have kids. Therefore, she was spurned uh, in bitterness. And she was also a midwife or uh, before what you would call a nurse practitioner. She'd be able to get in and out of the district, the White Chapel district, quite easy. And so what it was is that she was binging all the women that she had found out that he had slept with and wanted to create justice and bring it in her own hands. Because you know what they say about a scorned woman. <laughs> right, right. That's a fascinating twist. As I read through the scene and then as I went to Amazon and read a little bit more about the book, I was curious if you've ever heard of a book called Vincent alias Jack by Dale Lerner. You know, I believe I could have. I've read and heard so many and I may have. Well, it's an interesting book, and I came across it, I want to say around 2009, because it was when I first put my books out that I was talking with Dale about various things, primarily about his book. And um, he posits that maybe it was Vincent Van Gogh who was Jack the Ripper. Have you ever heard this theory? I have heard so many, including okay. my, my friend, Jeff Mudgett. Jeff, for anybody who has never seen American Ripper on the History Channel, Jeff is the great, 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 hopefully never left out a great grandson of H.H. H. Holmes, who is the serial killer in Chicago. Okay. And Jeff's quest on American Ripper was to prove that H.H. H. Holmes was actually Jack the Ripper, that Jack had fled London, England, and mm -hmm. came over to Chicago at the World's Fair and started doing his killing there. And so, so that is... I've heard that theory. Um, I all, I really liked the Queen's grandson or nephew. Those theories there, where you get into the whole royal conspiracy theory. And this 
why I got interested in this because, and he's a friend of mine on uh, Facebook, I've connected with him, John Douglas. So if you've ever seen Mindhunter on Netflix, one of the characters is based on John Douglas. Him and Robert Ressler were two of the leading pioneers in FBI profiling. And John, back in the late 1980s into the early 90s, they did him and Roy Hazelwood. Roy was a retired FBI agent. He looked at sexual sadistic killers, and Roy was one of my teachers. And they were on a panel with a member of Scotland Yard. And so they were given the evidence. And as the two prof two FBI profilers in Scotland Yard, if they were presented this evidence today, who would they pick? And both Roy and I believe, I know John picked them, and I believe why they both picked Aaron Kosminski, also known as Leather Apron. Uh, they had him as Jack the Ripper. I love both those guys, Roy and John, but I always thought it's just too easy. And then a few few years back, they came out, oh, we have DNA now off of, you know, and then they've linked it to Aaron Kosminski. But if you look at the probability based on the DNA sample, it it, it, it really doesn't narrow it down. It narrows it down as much as uh, Zodiac. How would they have DNA? Are we talking about DNA from Jack the Ripper? From Jack the Ripper, I believe it was off of one of the scarves. I want to say if it was Catherine Edo, I forget which one it was out of the canonical, the canonical five, the five women that were most tied to Jack. Mm -hmm. And they were able to get blood off of it. And they believe the theory is in, you know, folks can Google it. And they said, okay, this one is the best match versus going and looking at the queen's doctor so let's rule out the queen's doctor let's rule out the various artists other than van besides van gogh mm -hmm. um, and then we can go you know montague drew it the whole list of them and then there's another fellow that sounds his name's almost spelt the same as aaron kosminski and so there was this list a mile long so i just thought for fun let's make it a woman possibly <laughs> let's see i just learned more in three minutes about Jack the Ripper than I've ever known. <laughs> I yeah, wanted because... to ask you real quick before we move on to cocktail number two, I, I said on a different note, no pun intended, <laughs> you have a number of music videos on your website. Now some of those you produce, but you write music too, don't you? Yeah, well, <clears throat> make a long story short, back in the 80s, I was a lead, lead vocalist, rhythm guitar player in a band. I was in university, so there was five of us on this band, two of the two of us, and not yours truly included, and two others who were not the part of yours that wanted to drink, drug, rock and roll, pick up a lot of girls, go do the bar scene. Our goal was to actually go into a studio and cut music on 16 track back on the day, because that's what it was. Um, I chose, looking back on it, the more practical route of getting a education and making something with my life as I, you know, I had role models say that, you know, focus on what's going to make you pay your bills or whatever. So friends of mine did make it big in the eighties. They're still around today, like honeymoon suite, um, the spoons, Ray Lyle, who's a brother to me. Um, he was huge and he could have been mega huge around the world. And I'm currently doing stuff with Ray. I'm a very strong Christian. Ray has gone from rock star to pastor. And so we are now doing Christian music videos, which are more of a Christian rock. And we're recreating his Juno Award song, Carry Me, from 1989. And now it's a, an acoustic version coming out this year where I'm doing a video based on the fentanyl crisis that is hitting North America, especially the homeless and those in need that are starving. And that's what we're doing the video about as a tribute to them. Fantastic. I don't mean to appear like I'm not paying attention. <laughs> my, my plug on my computer is really touchy and the battery is at the tail end of its life. And so I'm trying to get the electricity to flow to the computer through the plug. <laughs> I, I'm not not listening to what you're saying. Yeah, I was really, I listened to the one, what was it called? Hallelujah Glory. Oh, Hosanna Mighty Savior. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, and it looked like that was one you produced, but then some of the others that looked like you had written music for some of your short films. Yep. I was kind of, of laughing. Still as a guitarist. I was kind of laughing too because 
my degree is in music and Chris, Chris and I both play trombone and organ and he also plays guitar, drums, all kinds of things. And he said the same as you, he had to decide between music and something practical that pays the bills. So vacation versus <laughs> vocation. And, right. <clears throat> and you so, know, the, the interesting part is, is that we grew up in a generation and I got, I, and I'll argue this with anybody growing up in the eighties, I see today's even kids, my kids, they would give their right teeth to have grown up in the 80s. Because I remember growing in the 80s, I wanted, oh man, I wish I could have been in the 60s because I was a huge Doors fan, Beatles fan, and also Elvis fan. That's why I wanted. But then as soon as I heard Eddie Van Halen and Eric Clapton, I was in love, head over heels. But the 80s was just a phenomenal time, which, yeah, is, it was. which is interesting that if we would have had all the gadgets in the 80s that they have today, I probably would have went into music. Because I would have been able to do both, I would have had the ability to have a an audience. And this is unfortunately a famous musician who is probably in the upper echelon ever to walk this planet as a musician. He even said, it. "A lot of today's music is just recycled, manufactured propaganda company stuff." That is, you know, you can put a song together and only have five words in it. And yeah, yeah. And okay, that, down in the seventies too. Na 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 na. Batman. Yeah. Right. Close enough. <laughs> We're on to cocktail number two. So what is this, Chris? <clears throat> so I was inspired by the vampire orientation of the reading, and particularly the neck bite aspect of things, and so found a cocktail called the Love Bite, which I think also speaks a bit to how vampires operate, if you will. <laughs> and so uh, to me, this I thought was kind of neat. So here what we have is some orange liqueur, uh, which is Cointreau. We have a cherry liqueur, which is Luxardo, cranberry juice, and then ending with some heavy cream. And uh, all that goes into a shaker with lots of ice and will then get served in a bit of a martini glass. So you get kind of the interesting flavors of the cherry and the orange coming in with a little bit of the bitter taste of the cranberry, even the, you know, evened out then by the cream. And one could potentially say that a vampire's bite is somewhat reminiscent mm -hmm. of uh, those types of, of uh, tastes. And we're finished pouring it in. And presumably this is not the one that you put sprinkles on the rims because that would make a mess at this point. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's the third drink. So here we have our love bite. Cheers. Cheers. That has a kick to it. That's got a nice tart kick, but not too tart. That's so it's a little bit like milkshake, but with alcohol. So <laughs> yes, indeed. Cheers. <laughs> reading number two. Okay, so reading number two is a non-fiction, and it is based on an interest with serial killers but more to tv so just to make a little uh precursor to this i hosted a tv series for five years niagara's most haunted slash then it became the paranormal profilers so i used to get invited to a ton of comic cons so i found myself at most of these comic cons hanging out with the folks from the walking dead the tv show mm -hmm. as well as other folks and i was sitting at this one comic con i'm going to say it's probably about 2015 ish and this is something that i wrote because my students they read my stuff and they wanted something interesting that tied to serial killers and kind of what they were watching so while recently in toronto i was waiting to get a coffee when actor ian summerholder who plays damon in the vampire diaries approached in my direction i looked at him did a, did a double take and he smirked we shook hands and started chatting the conversation turned to shop talk since he plays a vampire in a popular tv series vampire diaries and i have happened to written a couple of vampire stories. It was after I walked away that the vampire idea I had been discussing with other writers struck me again. As I got my sandwich and coffee together, Ian strolled past me, gently punched me in the shoulder and said, best of luck with your work. I was about to respond with a suitably sarcastic remark. Note him and I were being <laughs> exchanging sarcastic little digs about stuff uh, regarding neck biting, but instead I wished him all the best vampires they were and have been the craze for the last eight years or so but only these are a little different from the traditional Bela Lugosi types and the savage breed who were spawned from the vampire culture 
Instead, ever since Bram Stoker's Dracula, which romanticized vampires and gave them a heart, vampire books, movies, and TV shows have been pushing lovable vampire types. Of course, vampires were then joined by furry, lovable werewolves, unlike the Lon Chaney types from decades ago. The werewolf was not as well embraced as the bloodsuckers, that is, unless you were on Team Jacob. Something else did uh, come along to knock vampires off their balcony roosts and capture the interest of TV viewers and gamers, zombies, walkers, the walking dead. George Romero could have never imagined in his wildest dreams that zombies could and would be so well received and embraced like they are now. In fact, Haiti, homeland to these mindless amnesiacs, doesn't even embrace them as much as Canadians love maple syrup and Americans love hot apple pie. We now have flesh eaters replacing blood suckers center stage and all walks of life running toward them. As I was finishing my coffee not long after chatting with Ian, I had the great fortune to sit down and have a chat with David Morrissey, formerly the governor on the hit TV series, The Walking Dead. David has been in a number of memorable movies, and I mentioned that The Reaping is one of my favorites, but he really became notoriously popular for The Walking Dead. I believe it was the lead character who turned the term, the term biters to describe zombies. The TV series has done amazingly well and continues to grow in leaps and uh, bounds beyond the success of the graphic novels. David and I discussed a little bit of the show and its success. Earlier this year, I was chatting with Irony Singleton, who played T-Dog on The Walking Dead. He uttered the same sentiments in terms of the success of the show and its amazing fan base. Whichever way you slice it, there is intense fascination, curiosity, attraction, romance, and dare I even say, love of monsters, the undead kind. With Hollywood cranking out mega Marvel and DC comic hero movies, one after the other, why do vampires and zombies continue to attract the attention of so many? A Very question nice. I always have, um, especially as I also like to write paranormal, I have to ask, what did you do on Antarctica if you've done all this work on seven continents? Interestingly, one of the film festivals that I was in they had a film festival tied to Antarctica, but I believe it was in Iceland. It was the Icelandic film festival that was called the Arctic or the Antarctic Film Festival. It was one of the two, and that's going back a while ago. And I want to say, I, I don't even remember which one it was. I've done a ton of documentaries. It was one of the documentaries, and it absolutely made me laugh out loud because the ongoing joke that I had friends is I'm going to see if I can do all seven continents. Let's see if I can do it because I have zero training in film. I have okay. never been trained on how to use a camera. I've never been trained on how to edit, never trained on how to direct. The closest I ever came to it was a script that I wrote, which is called Touch by Grace, which then became a book that, as I was told, made a lot of women cry around the world, including several actresses that read the script. And a late dear good friend of mine, Joe Mayer, he was a supervising ADR in movies like Pretty Woman, Heat with Michael Mann, and one of his most famous movies was Braveheart with Mel. And, oh, and I, was supposed to, I was supposed to meet Mel back in the late 90s, and that didn't happen because something had unfortunately happened in Mel's life. I was supposed to meet him in Bakersfield, California to go down there. But it was Joe who always said, do it yourself produce you know your own film it's like cho i have no idea i live in niagara falls how do i get a guy he goes just you know you get your you get the money together and all that stuff and that was where a lot of it laura that's where i stuck to writing books so i would take my scripts that i had written a ton of them some on non-disclosure agreements which were you know optioned off but i went the novel route because as i said I've got no training in film school or whatever. I'm a psychologist by trade, so. Yeah, but a lot of these things we can learn. You know, we can teach ourselves. And that's one thing I like about music. If you do it well, it doesn't matter who you are, what your training is. I do want to touch on this question as a psychologist, especially. Mm. What is your answer to why we're drawn to vampires and monsters and things? What I can put my finger on with it, and I have spoken to a lot of characters at these Comic-Cons. 
The one in Toronto, I believe the San Diego one's huge, but the one in Toronto is absolutely ridiculous. Like there's 120,000 people that came through over four days and we were one of the most popular booths because if I could show you, I recreated a miniature village which is ginormous and it's got all famous movie houses in it. And most of them are horror movies. Uh -huh. In the horror movie, I probably have it in that village. So everybody comes, gets their picture taken with it. A lot of celebrities come over and it's it's quite amusing and quite entertaining but to go to your question internal life i think a lot of the reasons if you look at zombies they're undead what is a vampire undead and i think this is the the romance with this or the love affair is it with it's basically like the alphaville song forever young and i believe that's kind of what it is this sense of staying alive forever never yes. aging I am curious, have you ever heard of the vampire of Melrose Abbey in Scotland? Yes, I have. I saw it, I believe I saw it on Amazon Prime on some show, some documentary, some little really? show. Yeah. Okay. It's just to recap for our, what are we up to, 8.7 million listeners? Uh, yeah, we grew a couple hundred thousand yeah. in the last couple of years. Yeah, days. we did. Our last guest was good. So <laughs> you better do better. <laughs> <laughs> No pressure, though. Um, yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those drinks you're making there. Really um, here, can we, uh, technology isn't that advanced yet, is it? Um, we'll send you the recipe. It's That second one is really good. So for our 8.7 million listeners, which is a scientifically deduced number, the vampire of Melrose Abbey was told, do you happen to remember, I think, the 1200s? is when this story is from 1100s maybe melrose abbey was fairly new at the time and there is um one of the histories of scotland they recorded this and the monks told them this is what happened and there were originally four monks who were watching he was called the hund press the the dog priest because he was not living a very moral life he was chasing women and wine and drink and song and and it's these these priests tell how they watch the grave and this man came up from the grave and kept coming up from the grave and walking around and in your next reading you will call yourself a man of science and you've said you're a christian as both a man of faith and a man of science what do you make of a story like this that tells us something we don't believe in modern days and yet it's being told by these priests who have everything to lose by why? You know, I believe, and as this is this is just my humble opinion, and I hope folks don't start to go, ah, he's one of those tinfoil hatters. Mm -hmm. I believe a lot has been withheld from us. I believe there's a lot of truths that are about to come out. And I, as Negan on Walking Dead says, people better be ready to put on their pee-pee pants. I think there's a lot of stuff that has definitely been held out throughout the ages. I believe there's a significant influence of power by a very 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 select few that determine what goes into the media and what people should believe and what they shouldn't believe and i think at the end of the day as a christian i think when you put god first and foremost in your life he always promises one thing when you ask him for wisdom he will show you he will pull the scales back from your eyes and you'll see stuff and for me that's been a lot for me to see through people see through things and i think you know as a criminal psychologist as a psychologist i need to i was a person that could be a human lie detector so i read people so okay. having said that even turning on mainstream media i can't i can't watch it i can look at stuff and i can find flaws within seconds mm -hmm. and i see it i've been trained to because coming up through psychology my background was just for starters in psychology of television and communication so it was my prof who was the most published in all of canada in media and television history that told us as a lecture hall in 1989 how many people watch the news people you know the whole lecture put their hands up how many people believe in the news the whole lecture put their hands up and then she said well i'm going to turn people into smarties and not dummies because i'm going to teach you a lot Mm -hmm. And those were great words of wisdom because it opened my eyes. And I, yeah. guess, I, I guess I was red-pilled very early on. I was too. Long story short, 
It was 1989 that I did a major, major research project. I was thinking of writing a thesis in college. And that's when I realized there's an awful lot the newspapers are not telling us. And if they told us the entire story, people would see things very differently and they would not vote for the things they're voting for. Mm. Voting for it because they believe half the story. In fact, they believe, <laughs> try not to get me started. You better just make that third drink. <laughs> 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 so what's up for number three? So as I read the third reading, I was particularly intrigued by the discussion of a haunted mansion and or a haunted house. And so I have a cocktail here called the, haunt, the haunted mansion. Mm. And uh, we start with, uh, as we usually do, a shaker full of uh, ice. And one of the interesting things about this drink is that we end up with some wonderful coating on the glasses. This is a purple sugar coating on the uh, on the glass. First of all, we're going to put in some vodka, which is always a good thing. <laughs> this is the second shot of vodka going in. As we have, uh, yeah, I made two drinks worth, so second jigger. And what is this going in? Uh, vodka, still vodka. vodka. Mm -hmm. Then we have... Uh, one of the fun parts of making um, uh, mixed drinks is uh, blue curacao, which uh, always gives us a wonderful color and a bit of a nice flavor going into drinks. Also, it can be very, very tropical, which is nice. Especially and, with all this snow and cold. Right. This is a good thing. Then, of course, we're going <clears> to, <throat> without trying to tip over the drink, also put in some grenadine, which, uh, you know, any of us who grew up a long time ago uh, may have had a Shirley Temple with our parents and you know grenadine was a big feature of that and made us think that we were all grown up <laughs> when in fact we weren't um then we put in some uh, cranberry juice and the neat part of this is by the time we're done it's going to be kind of a neat purple color to go along with the uh, purple sugar and so let me hold this up in front of the camera if you can see that uh it's got a purple rim on it and I will have more of a close-up, too. All righty. We're going to shake that up. And then we'll pour that into the glass. It came out very nicely with its purple color. Here you go, Laura. So, yes, you can see this. And if I tip it so you can see the rim, um, we're going to have a real mess on our hands. So <laughs> we won't be doing that. The Haunted um, Mansion. Cheers. Yes. Hmm. That's, I like it. This is the kind of thing that doesn't taste like alcohol. It's just. <laughs> so it's very easy going down. Right. This tastes like a pleasant summer drink. And that's the kind of thing you could uh, just pleasantly keep drinking. <laughs> pleasantly just keep going. Yeah. Until you pleasantly fall over. <laughs> all right. Let's but you hear. better not do it in a haunted house. <laughs> well, then you wouldn't see all the haunted mm, stuff right. coming at you. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's a benefit to that. Reading number three. Okay, and I, so, I have a prop for this reading, by the way. I have a story to tell you about haunted houses. Uh, it, it's interesting because you're drinking spirits. And here we are talking about spirits. Yes. And that's, that's the funny thing. While I was doing the TV series, it's like some of the ones we interviewed, some of the folks, it's like, okay, are they possessed? But what are they possessed by? An actual spirit or Jack Daniels? Okay. Right. So this is from Paranormal Niagara, the book that I wrote. And by the way, the last book that I wrote, uh, that I read on the serial killers, vampires, and uh, walkers, that's free as well. They're both free on my website. So you can download those for anybody watching and enjoy them. Um, so this one was based, it was the third book that I wrote in conjunction with the CV series I hosted, Niagara's Most Haunted, which was now in, it was in its second season. So I created the series based on my factual book of the same name, Niagara's Most Haunted Legends and Myths. I live in one of the most beautiful places in the entire world called the Niagara region. Sure, it boasts a home to one of the most amazing wonders of the world, Niagara Falls. It has some of the most eye-popping scenery, both naturally created and man-made as well. It is also the home of the most historical bloody battles in North American history, which is the War of 1812. Side note, I live right where the War of 1812 was fought literally, our property is on. Some experts in the field of paranormal research, ghost investigation, and pseudo-psychological research claim that the Niagara region is a hotbed for paranormal and haunted activities. Furthermore, 
some claim that Niagara Island Lake is the most haunted town in North America. Is it any wonder people come to try and see ghosts on the many ghost walks made available for the curious? I have been asked many times as to whether or not I believe or disbelieve. Oftentimes I sit on the fence and answer, I don't know. I know I am a coward perhaps, more so when it comes to me answering questions about my beliefs on ghosts versus actually going to these haunted places, which I might add is very fun. I must admit, being a man of science and needing to see it to believe it, when it comes to the stuff, I have actually learned a lot about things that supposedly go bump in the night through filming this series. My production team and I have gone through many haunted places and have been fortunate to interview some really cool, interesting, and informed people. After all, when you have so many historical sites linked to the War of 1812, there is a lot of history linked to these sites and, of course, ghost stories. And just a side note with this book, as I said, you can download. It includes the most famous poltergeist case in North American history from 1970 that I do have in my possession seven signed police reports. And I spoke with two of the cops that were there where this show, this case was so famous it made Johnny Carson's Tonight Show and people wow. are coming from California and just uh, some spoiler alerts lasted 28 days last seen in the whole poltergeist case which probably is more of a, a possession case kid was floating on the bed about two feet off the ground and the Scott Robert or um, Scotty Crawford Bob Scotty Crawford, God rest his soul, was the police officer from day one. He saw that on the last day where he was in the room. Everything went whitewashing off the walls, flying around like a snowstorm except the crucifix. And the kid was floating on a bed. And prior to that, we have equivalent, we have a crown attorney, which would be an American district attorney. He had come to the house and witnessed three adults sitting on a couch floating a foot and a half off the ground. And this was not the Amityville horror? No, this uh, this... You know, this is right up there with it. And as I said, I've got the police reports as a former criminal psychologist. Uh, most of my best friends are cops. They know the case and all of them to this day say it's legend. It's not myth, it's legend, it's real. And I don't know of any cop in their right mind that would sign their name to any report that said that stuff was happening. But yet I've spoken to two of the three cops that were there for the 28 days and they saw it and I've got the police reports. Mm -hmm. Are you done with your reading? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You said as an aside, so I was kind of waiting for you to go back to the reading, and it suddenly dawned on me. <laughs> so the reading kind of blended into talking, but it's a fascinating story. I was curious, how, especially since you said you're not trained in film production at all, how did you get from a book to having your own TV series? You know, that's it's a good question. First of all, I created this series because I wanted to get individuals that were foreign to my country or visiting this country interested in our history. Mm -hmm. I believe history is our legacy that we need to teach our kids, grandkids, great-grandchildren to keep our stories going. And this was my way of doing it. So literally what I did is I uh, backdoor history into a ghost show. And it's kind of funny because over the years I've worked with folks who became friends, Steve DeShebe, from um, the Dead Files, Steve is a great guy. Uh, Jack Kenna, he's been on shows. Uh, Michelle Belanger, I was on Paranormal Survivor a couple times. So some of them do tell a history, but you know they're focused on the ghost story. But what I wanted to do is actually tell the history, because in my humble opinion, uh, the history itself is like ghosts from our past speaking to us, so that we can kind of keep whatever is going. And I covered all walks of different. Uh, both sides of the board, Canadian, U.S. side, a lot of really cool stuff. I'm curious, especially going back to this, you say you're a man of science, you're hesitant to say you believe in ghosts. What are some of the most interesting things that you have personally seen or experienced in the course of doing this show and doing the research for this book? You know, okay, so I, I taught paranormal psychology for a couple of years at the college level. It was called Understanding the Paranormal, which was quote unquote, an X-Files course. It was a fun thing that I decided to just try see. We had a wait list for the course. We had to turn, had to awesome. turn students away. And folks would ask me, they go, well, you're a man of science. How do you believe in this stuff? Because they said, I'm a man of God too. So mm -hmm. and you look in the Bible, what is there? Father, Son, um, Holy Ghost. 
when the disciples saw Christ walking in the water, what did they think they saw coming towards them? A ghost. So they had been exposed, obviously, to that stuff. So if you go into science itself, some people believe that ghosts are like Polaroids, that it's just energy that's replaying itself over and over in a film. So it's like it, people will see it, but you can't interact with it. You'll see this thing moving. OK, mm -hmm. I believe that there's a uh, universe, the universal ether or whatever. It, there's a, res, a residual effect that's left and you can kind of see it much like you would a camera projection. And the folks that I've spoken with that have seen that. And by the way, I've never seen that per se. They would say I'd ask them, can you communicate with that entity? And it's like, no, it's like you try that. It's like, no, it's like. But then again, I, spar I, I speak to my husband and I get the same response. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in the honeymoon. He still answers me. <laughs> well, I plan on that, being in the honeymoon for the next 50 years. Yes, so, I, so. I will go to the other side of the coin. I have actually sat there, and it was not my choice. It was the last thing I ever wanted to see. I once went to a church event, and I only wanted to go there for the pie, a piece of apple cobbler pie or apple crumble pie, whatever it was, and a coffee. And so I, I knew the, the British minister he came from england he was a former uh detective homicide detective who became a pastor here in canada came over and i just wanted to go visit with them and so i went caught the end of the service and at the end of the service they were doing a call up and i watched what and you know i saw demon i saw demonic possession no doubt about it it took it, it, this person that was possessed for a better okay. word the eyes were rolling in a socket he was foaming and he was speaking arabic and other stuff this guy was no more than 21 years old and it took 12 people to hold him down. And I got invited to be the 12th person to come hold this it down, so to speak. And what I saw was absolutely, it was horrific. The way, the, 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 what the kid was saying and mm -hmm. how he was saying it and how he looked. Fast forward, and this was probably the kicker for me finishing with the TV series. We were filming in an old B&B. In that old B&B, we had found out there had been a hanging, somebody had committed suicide. And when the people had bought this historical 200 year old, eventually repair people would not set foot in the house. They then stripped down the upper level and they found pentagrams on the floor and a lot of demonic stuff. Amazing building. Mm -hmm. We were filming in the house. There was 12 of us. I was directing that day and we usually used to bring a guest investigator in. So I had a former high ranking member of the Canadian army. He came to be our guest investigator. During that, we watched the owner's husband start to have an apparent heart attack. That whatever it was, a shadow figure, and I did see this thing go up the wall and disappear. After I heard a disembodied voice, which myself and 12 other people, including skeptics, heard build a room. And to this day, I saved it. I have it on tape. Mm -hmm. And it was after that uh, event, Laura, I had went home. I felt like something was watching me all night in my doorway of my bedroom. I couldn't sleep. It was the most restless sleep I had in my life other than when I felt sick with a, a flu or a cold. We touched base the next day because people reached out and said, did anybody else feel haunted or spooked that night and feel like somebody was watching them? Almost everybody said something followed them home. From that point in, I was done. I, I, I said, I, I'm doing this for history and I'm doing uh -huh. it for the camaraderie and the fun. But when it gets to that point, and I watched evil happen in that area, yes, for whatever reason, and thank gosh, one of the individuals that, quote unquote, is the psychic medium, is a nurse. She tended to this person and said, yeah, he was having the onset of a potential heart attack. And this, there was three psych, two, two or three psychic mediums there. They all said this thing, this shadow figure, which is a demonic entity, attacked mm -hmm. them. And that's where I said, exit, stage left, I'm done. And that's, that's fascinating to me. Talk about being a man of science. And I think, you know, supposedly women are more emotional and men are more logical. I'm very, I'm very logical. <laughs> you know, I base things on logic. And that plays into this whole question of ghosts. Because I, I don't want to say I believe in ghosts. Emotionally, I do not want to say that. Like, oh, come on. It's just stories. And yet the logical part of my brain says there are hundreds of thousands of ghost stories over the centuries. They didn't all make it up. So I wanted to tell you this story. This is a candle. <laughs> this is a candle that 
did not exist in our lives until it did. So we moved into a house in Duluth and it's just a really, it was a really amazing house. Um, if anybody would like to buy it, it's for sale and you should really make us an offer. When we moved into this house and it's fairly modern, you know, the, the house itself was a little house built up on a hill on like 29, 30 acres backing up to a state park. So it's very kind of remote. And then the previous owners, uh, he was a restaurateur in Duluth and he built all these amazing restaurants and he could do whatever he wanted. So he did and he built this amazing addition. But unfortunately, he had a lot of health issues he had had one organ transplant, he needed another, and he died relatively young. From everything I know, he had quite a sense of humor. So we had lived in the house about eight months, and all of a sudden this was sitting on our mantelpiece, and our mantelpiece was bare. There's no way we missed this. Within the first few days we moved there, our box of wine and our Irish cream disappeared. <laughs> so we always blame that on our ghost. Um, and like I said, if, if it's the previous owner, I think he had a sense of humor from everything I know of him. And it's like, that is exactly what he would do. And at the same time, we're like, Brian, <laughs> give our Irish cream back. That's so pricey. Exactly. Um, Especially now. So, right. Yeah. So then one day a pair of readers like glasses just appeared on our counter, but, and then in our shower, we had like a kind of a band mosaic. And it was missing one little tile. And this was maybe a year and a half after we moved into the house. I had this fantastic walk-in closet. And I always kept it very neat and clean. All the countertops completely bare. One day I walked in there. And there is this little tile from the shower mm -hmm. sitting on my counter. You know, like, how does that happen? That's impossible. He didn't put it there. I didn't put it there. Mm -hmm. And nobody else was in the house. And this tile missing from the shower was just there mm -hmm. so i i did appreciate your stories about the haunted houses <laughs> so, yeah, and, and you know what it is it, it you look at people go well, should should you be afraid of them <laughs> unless you have a reason to be then you know because I, I i was once told by the folks i worked with on the show that there are mischievous spirits and so once again it's I find my keys missing sometimes, which is absolutely ludicrous because, or something's just missing when I just knew it was there. I go looking and then I come back and it was where I looked originally and then it's there. So it, it, it you know, it, it all depends on, you know, what I was always taught and it's why I got away from it. I, you know, I can witness them or whatever, but the thing is uh, I ain't going to communicate with them. Well, we also know this is God for all God can create what he wants. Right. And if these things are part of it, and it's not for us necessarily to say yay or nay, you know, yep. so much as to say this is God's world. By the same token, we also know that evil exists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those kind of demonic aspects are also there. And we need to resist them and make sure that we uh, right. we stay apart. You right. Know? You know, so where can people find you? The best place to go is to my website, peterandrewsacco.com. And I'm also on social media. I'm on Facebook. I am back on there more with a presence. I kind of took the last two years away. It was just, I don't know what that was. Mm -hmm. And same thing with Twitter and back because I, I, I connect with different folks. And because we have the new music video coming out and we're going into more film festivals and that stuff, you know, I'm, I, I've got to put in the effort to be on social media. Do you have any events? You know what, Chris? On my YouTube channel, which is Historical Niagara TV Show, I did two self ghost tours that you can watch and take. Hey, you can watch. I go to each site and I explain the ghost stories. With that said, I this threw out the other eggs. People mugging me. I, I where I'm living here, we had a B and B here. We don't do it anymore. But I had people coming from around the world who wanted to stay here. Some had read my book. Some had seen me on TV. And then they're like, "Can you take us on a ghost tour? Can you take us on some tour or whatever?" So for fun. I'm putting together a car rally, a volunteer one. People want to get involved to it. They can show up or deciding on sometime in February, weather pending, the numbers that I would get. And, you know, the only thing I'm saying is if anybody can donate, we have like a project share. It's a food bank. 
and I'm going to take the folks on this, <laughs> not like the Gilligan's Island three-hour tour. This is going to be a lot longer because we're going from Fort Erie, which is near Buffalo, all the way down to um, Niagara on the Lake, which is your equivalent is Youngstown, New York, to the old forts there. And I, I just threw it out for fun at the beginning of the week. And it's like, yep, yes, please count me in. So I already got a ton of people. So I Very good. That sounds like fun. Where like, can we find books and brews? So Michael Agnew and I, this is not Michael Agnew. Michael is taking a break. Michael Agnew is Minnesota's first beer Cicerone. And he and I are at booksandbrews.net. We're also at, at this point, Michael usually introduces us. He takes a deep breath and he says, www.facebook.com slash booksandbrews with Laura Vosik and Michael Agnew. <laughs> <laughs> That's and mouthful. Then, <laughs> and then he draws a deep breath. I am at lauravosika.com oh. or bluebellschronicles.com. And uh, Michael is at aperfectpint.net. And um, I think that covers everything. As far as my upcoming events, I actually have some. We will be at the Overhome Trading Post on February 10th in Thornhill, Tennessee. And I'm Selling starting... rabbit poop. Yes. <laughs> rabbit poop is extremely good fertilizer. So um, there is no better exercise in humility than <laughs> making your living in rabbit poop. <laughs> Um, I'm starting to contact people to book other events, and um, so I'll have some soon. I have articles being published at booksbywomen.com. I have an interview coming up on a historical fiction podcast in May, and I have another article coming up at, I believe her name is Helen Pollock.com. So and I'm actually... not last, who yes. is our guest for next month? So... I'm very excited. The last couple months have been um, some it's upheaval. Rather excited. I, I am. <laughs> yeah. So Teresa Halverson was supposed mm -hmm. to be on last month. Teresa is an author and a publisher herself. She's the author to The Dad's Playbook to Labor and Delivery and Warehouse Dreams and countless articles on pregnancy, birth, and parenting. So is the mother of uh, nine and a half slash ten. <laughs> Nine of whom I gave birth to. I'm I'm excited to talk to her. Um, her true love is speculative fiction. As I said, she's also a publisher. She enjoys interacting with other writers and helps produce a writing podcast called The Semi-Sages of the Pages. She co-runs a writer's group in, I can't Temecula. even... Temecula. Oh, you know mm -hmm. this place? I do. I've been there. <laughs> Wonderful uh, fruit and vegetable market. Okay. They meet once a month, and by that I mean the writer's group, not the meat and vegetable market Which or is whatever right. you just said. And she belongs to various critique groups, so I'm looking forward to talking to her. And that concludes episode 58, so we have no cheers. drinks left, but cheers anyway. Thank you.